Thank you, Jan. Uh, so I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's a great honor, especially on such an occasion. And like many of us, I was greatly influenced by Maxim. Um, so I'll talk today about a connection between math and physics. So I'm a physicist, and I'm interested in physics, physics component of the story. But uh, it's a nice bridge between uh, what I'll hope I'll explain to you as very rich mathematics and very rich uh, physics. So every talk uh, is a delicate balance between telling the truth, meaning presenting all the details, proving all the theorems, explaining everything. But then there is a danger that we'll be bogged down on those details and we'll never see uh, the big picture. So I'll try to make this delicate balance between presenting big picture with lots of pictures and also some of the concrete results and examples. So I'll try to emphasize those points where I'll have at least two concrete results in this talk. One is going to be concrete new results for mathematics using this correspondence that I'll explain, and one will be actually new result for physics. Uh, mathematicians in the audience probably don't care if uh, there is a new result for physics, but I certainly do. And of course, all the details uh, that I'm going to miss in trying to maintain this delicate balance could be found in some of the papers I mentioned here with uh, two great guys, uh, Abhijit Gadi and Pavel Putrov. So what we'll really do in this talk is we'll study, well, as this physics guy says, five brains on co-associative four manifolds inside a G2 holonomy space. And uh, that's actually what we're going to do throughout this talk in this uh, hour. And there is a famous cartoon which uh, shows there are different versions of it. Uh, this is for IT guys. This is uh, you tell dogs something and they hear, uh, OK, ginger, blah, 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 ginger, and so on. <laughs> so uh, si similar in this uh, opening line, there are some words which may be very familiar to you, but uh, there might be some words which are te terribly mysterious. For example, I imagine to mathematicians, the word five brain is very mysterious, and everything else probably is more or less uh, familiar, maybe not too well, but at least it's from math. For physicists, actually, the situation is reversed, I have to say. Physicists really understand only one word, five brain, and all this co-associative, four-manifold, G2, holonomy space to physicists. Actually, that's even worse. So, Anyway, I'll try to explain what the five brain is. So since I'm aiming this talk more for a mathematical audience, what are five brains? These are very rich, interesting objects in 11-dimensional uh, M-theory, but and they, they have a lot of rich structure, but at the zero level of approximation, they're just six-dimensional submanifolds. So these are certain gadgets supported on six manifolds inside 11-dimensional spacetime. That's all you have to know. They do carry some additional structure. For example, beyond the zero level of approximation, you can have multiple such uh, sub-varieties. And then multiplicity gives rise to symmetry, which is typically UN or SUN. That's what we're going to consider in this talk most of the time. So there will be G, which is either UN or SUN. Some group, compact group of Cartan type A, and N here will refer to multiplicity of those six-dimensional uh, subspaces in 11-dimensional spacetime. So here, uh, this picture is illustrating, this is cartoon for, for such embedded hypersurface in big space. And now the idea, which goes back uh, all the way to Carlos C. Klein, but uh, have actually far-reaching consequences, especially for us, is that what we'll do, the kind of game we'll play, is that we'll try to take this six-dimensional object, uh, six-dimensional five brain, and split its six dimensions into compact manifold MN, which is what we'll aim to study. And the remaining part will be just a flat Euclidean space of dimension six minus N. So here I'm using kind of obvious uh, if you wish, uh, I'll refer to this uh, kind of decomposition later on as 6 equals n plus uh, whatever is left, 6 minus n. The consequence of this, and um, again, physicists can tell you more and more about it, but this will be not just an extra talk, it will be a whole big course, how some theory, this extra data which lives in six dimensions, upon wrapping the six-dimensional big uh, 
space-time on some manifold of dimension n gives rise to some effective field theory in six minus n dimensions, which is labeled by space on which you compactify, by, by this compact uh, manifold mn. So this idea is fairly simple, and again, it, it's 100 years old, but its implementation for us will be fairly interesting and quite rich. So just the very fact that five brains exist uh, makes all these theories, lower dimensional theories in Euclidean dimension six minus n, labeled by other manifolds exist. So that's already basic fact, which is kind of punchline of the talk, if you wish. I'll, of course, put lots of bells and whistles on it. We'll explore it. But that's the idea. And it's fairly simple. So by the way, if you have any questions at, at any point, feel free to interrupt me. So, so six, perform field series six dimensions, which also they are labeled by ADE, right? Yes. So the, that's essentially the same story. So that's a six-dimensional conformal filter which lives on this five brain. So these terms are completely interchangeable. And uh, for me, AD will be always of Carton type A. So that's, that's the same story, indeed. Um, yeah, so the good point about this lower dimensional theory, which will be obviously in dimensions less than six, uh, is that such a theory, uh, upon compactifying the 6D theory on, on manifold MN, will actually depend on topology and also on geometry of the manifold M of dimension N that you choose. So this is, if you wish, a functor which sends N-dimensional manifolds into six minus N-dimensional theories, physical theories. That's a kind of funny functor, very strange object. But we're going to explore its consequences. And I'll start with something that's by now fairly well understood, at least many aspects of the story are well understood, and we'll play the game where we're going to split this uh, six dimensions in different ways. So first, here I'll split six as three plus three, and then of course uh, we'll come to four manifolds and split it into four plus two. So again, this is kind of simple algebra to keep in mind. So if you choose a three manifold, this little n equals three, then complementary dimension is also three. So what you get is a three-dimensional theory, I'll call it T of M3, which is labeled by three manifold that, uh, that, that you want. It carries certain supersymmetry. Again, there are lots of bells and whistles, but in the first round of approximation, I'm going to skip that. Now, you can view this construction, and that's the modern perspective on things, as constructing invariants of three manifolds and four manifolds, which are of completely different type that are not very familiar, that we don't usually think of. When we think of invariants of three manifolds, four manifolds, we typically think of numerical invariants. In recent years, people start talking about invariants of, say, knots and three manifolds, which take values in vector spaces. These are a categorification of numerical invariants. But this is something even more esoteric or weird in the sense that to a, a three-manifold or four-manifold, we associate a physical theory. And theory in uh, dimension six minus n would actually be of high categorical nature. It will be something that um, is not just a number, is not a vector space, but contains a lot of information, whole load of information, a lot more than just a number. Okay, sorry, is it compact or how is the boundary in this? Uh, boundary of each. Oh, three-manifold, for instance. You can develop the story where you have three manifolds with boundary, without boundary, so it's a good question. In other words, in this context, it's a perfectly valid question, and boundary, of course, will be important if it's present. If it's not, then, then it's not. Good thing is that you can recover some of the more familiar invariants of three manifolds, four manifolds, by trying to take this physical theory and ask a question, okay, what is the partition function of that theory? That, of course, is going to be number of function. You can ask about correlation function, something that Nikita considered in his talk, or various other gauges. For instance, simple question is to ask about supersymmetric vacua. I try to omit all the words infrared because I thought mathematicians don't know them, but now they do. So therefore, this is really about uh, infrared physics of such theory. You can ask, say, what a supersymmetric vacua? Uh, many of such theories, even in three dimensions, can be described by Landau-Ginzburg type potential function W. That's a holomorphic function exactly of the same type. And these are close cousins of two-dimensional theories that we heard in previous talk. And this will be, uh, this will be certain space. It may consist of isolated points. It may consist of um, 
continuous uh, sub-variety moduli space. But in any case, what happens is that this space of supersymmetric vacuum is nothing but space of flat connections on the three manifold M3. So if you start with AD fibranes of this AD type, of which for us will be either SUN or UN of type A, then this will be uh, complex flat connections for the same uh, complexified Lie algebra. So at least this theory, it's, it's not some stupid functor which takes three manifolds into some mysterious theory. It actually knows about, say, flat connections or character variety on a three manifold. So that's, that's one statement. And once you um, uh, start exploring this correspondence, basically the game of the rule, the, the rule of the game is that you explore different invariants of this uh, theory in lower dimensions and six minus d dimensions and ask for, again, different gadgets and field theory language and try to recover different invariants of three manifold, four manifold, and so on. Here I give an example, say M3 is a lens space, uh, say S3 mod ZK, and fundamental group is ZK, basically complex flat connections, just like uh, real flat connections are parameterized by homomorphisms from fundamental group, in this case ZK, into uh, the group G, modular conjugation. So this is a finite set, okay? A nice interesting fact is that this finite set happens to be um, labeled by the uh, same um, type of label, which uh, labels highest weight integrable representations of the loop group at level K. So this may be viewed at this level as a coincidence, but in fact, uh, you can try to work out what this theory, three-dimensional theory should be for lens space, and then you're going to find, so I'll erase this and save it for later. So theory associated to lens space, um, say K1, is Chern-Simons theory. In fact, certain supersymmetric extension of Chern Simons theory, but that won't be important to us at level k. Because if you ask yourself, have I seen uh, this somewhere? This indeed is the space of ground states in Chern Simons theory, either supersymmetric <coughs> or not. Um, so if you think of vacua being flat connections, then um, already this basic fact suggests, suggests that the theory associated to lens space should be some version of chern simons And it will play a role for us later. Now, <clears throat> you can ask about three manifolds which do have boundaries. So for instance, if you ask about not complements, which is another, another nice class of three manifolds with a toral boundary, either not complements or link uh, complements, then in this case, complex flat connections will come in families. Uh, in particular, if you talk about not or link with a sing single component, there is this famous A polynomial whose zero locus defines for you the character variety. And this is exactly the uh, space of critical points for three-dimensional theory, which is associated to not or link complement. And um, again, this is a nice class of examples. Uh, by studying this correspondence in present context, you can derive various versions of so-called volume conjecture. Um, one of the versions says that there is an operator which in physical theory on this side of the correspondence is some sort of word identity, very much like in Nikita's talk, that annihilates partition function. So, and then there are various upgrades which even get to, to homological invariants that I'll mention very briefly in a second. So this partition function z of m, what is this partition function? Well, you could think that if you already have access to space of classical solutions in Chern Simons theory, namely flat connections, there should be a way to quantize it, namely to construct the full uh, Chern Simons partition function of a three manifold M3. So now Chern Simons appears on this side, whereas a moment ago I was talking about Chern Simons uh, on this side of three plus three split. Now, yeah, there is such a, um, such a gadget, and there is a question, question about three-dimensional field theory T of M3, such that answer to that question is actually Chern Simons partition function on a manifold M3. The corresponding question here involves turning on omega background, very much like in Nikita's talk, and counting instantons, except that the problem here is lower dimensional. So uh, 
Nikita studied this omega deformation of four dimensional gauge theory where you have um, four dimensions of um, space time, both of them are considered in equivariant context. This is a baby version where instead of instantons, one has a sum of vortices, very much like in the work of Taubes and so on. And uh, again, one considers uh, equivariant vortices, meaning they live on a plane, and uh, we're trying to look at their representation with respect to rotation group in two out of three dimensions on this side. And um, that's a very well-defined quantity. Physicists study it, and funny enough, they recover a complex transhumance partition function over three manifold M3. So that's the, the relation here. So sorry, if we, the partition function is what? Is the vector in Hilbert space, or this quantization of the boundary? What's the left hand side? As, as not, no? No more Generally? Correct. So it's, um, it's, it's indeed a vector in if. Now, in the case of uh, three manifold with boundary, this will be a vector in the Hilbert space of um, associated to the boundary. Yeah, exactly. So, in particular, uh, it uh, in this context it depends on parameters, um, and uh, well, these are some of these parameters. And uh, on one side of the correspondence here, this operator equation, this word identity is known as quantum volume conjecture or some sort of AJ volume conjecture. And on this side of the correspondence, this is a statement that uh, quantization or a certain uh, operator relation associated with classical moduli space, because A, the zero locus of A was the classical moduli space of vacuum for three-dimensional theory here, uh, annihilates this vortex partition function. So that's, it, it, this statement has a meaning both in this world and this world, and luckily they agree. So, Again, there are lots of uh, papers on the so-called 3D, 3D correspondence. Um, by now, this is fairly big industry, and I'll just mention a couple of such applications. But my goal will be eventually to actually move to, to the next level and try to develop the same sort of dictionary or industry for studying theories labeled by four manifolds, because this is much more mysterious, both in physics and math. And uh, to my uh, mind, this is much, much cooler. Finally, um, I kind of suppressed, uh, for sake of presentation, the fact that there is some supersymmetry in this three-dimensional theory which is labeled by three-manifold. And this didn't play much role even in the example I mentioned here, but it is supersymmetric, and as such it has supercharge, so therefore you can ask for uh, invariant or object of associated to this theory, which is neither space of vacuum nor some number, such as partition function of a certain kind, but rather a space. Namely, a space of states which are annihilated by supercharged Q, but not Q exact. So in other words, we can ask, what is the Q cohomology in this theory which is labeled by three manifold? If theory itself is defined by three manifold and we ask for a certain question about it, the answer should also be, something that knows about three manifold. And again, if we talk about not complements, what's interesting is that this Kuko homology recovers mathematically defined Hovenov homology and its variants. So that's, that's an interesting. Let's say H stands for Havana, for Havana double graded. Yeah, so here on the left hand side, H actually stands for um, uh, SLN version of Hovan of homology, in fact, decorated perhaps with uh, various representations. Basically, categorification of quantum group invariants, uh, doubly graded space. And in physics uh, literature, such elements of Kuko homology are sometimes referred as BPS states. BPS states are uh, so called supersymmetric states. These are uh, states in the theory which are annihilated by Q but not Q exact. So that's a definition. So sometimes the statement is mentioned as um, not homology being, being interpreted as a space of uh, either supersymmetric or BPS states. Now, until so far, I talked about the six-dimensional theory, and um, we didn't even consider where it leaves. It actually leaves in big 11-dimensional ambient space, and um, that embedding of uh, six-dimensional sub-variety in big 11-dimensional uh, space is not arbitrary. Uh, basically, the picture is as follows. The 11-dimensional space consists of R5, five-dimensional vector space, and uh, Calabiao, which for most of the discussion we can take to be just total space of the cotangent bundle to three-manifold here. 
Uh, after all, neighborhood of any Lagrangian inside Collab BL looks like that, so that, that will be good enough. And we'll split some of the dimensions of the vector spaces, which are not used or not curved, in the following fashion, or will be singled out, and usually is interpreted as time. Think of time as in Fleur theory, and it will be useful in a second. And the rest is subject to uh, this equivariant omega deformation, which gives rise to Q grading and homological grading in application to, to not homologies. So again, uh, total world volume or support of these five brains is equal to six. So this is our three plus three split. This manifold is interesting, curved, has interesting topology and geometry that we want to detect. Here in this R3 leaves the three-dimensional theory I was discussing on the previous slide. And it's embedded like this in MB and 11 dimensional space. I want to point out already here that there is a four manifold inside, which will, which will be much more interesting in the rest of the talk. Namely, if you combine the time, which didn't participate in uh, rotation symmetries that we used, and three manifold here, this is basically indeed like a, a floor homology picture where you have uh, some non-trivial slice and across cross time, uh, Fleur time, uh, and together they make a four manifold or cross M3. So that's the first remark in passing, we'll come back to it in a second. Second remark I want to make about this embedding is that uh, you can look at this picture from many different viewpoints. That's very typical in physics. You can study the system from one perspective, from another perspective, you can look at it, for instance, from this point of view of R3 here, which gives some three-dimensional theory labeled by three-manifold, or you can look at this picture from the viewpoint of ambient space-time, in particular from the viewpoint of the Calabiao here. And then it gives rise to a certain enumerative problem, what we call by this a space of BPS states, and that context is more appropriately known as a space of so-called open and refined BPS states. So uh, there are many ways to approach this problem. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to do later is uh, something that, to which I alluded before, is consider this uh, R cross M3 and not just let it be a direct product, but rather consider evolution of a three manifold along R. In other words, consider non-trivial cobordisms. For instance, here is a cartoon which represents cobordism between, say, two uh, link complements, and this will relate, this will give rise to a functor between uh, different um, link homologies. Now, such functors are all very interesting, and again, if you ask yourself a question in this embedding of not homology in a physical setup, how would uh, cobordisms play a role? This is, this is how they would appear. They would take uh, one of the dimensions of this 11-dimensional picture, which has not been used, and combine it with M3 into a four-manifold. So if you want to study functors acting on homological knot invariance, which is something that uh, I've been studying in the past several years, you are inevitably uh, coming to, to the picture of uh, four-manifolds, which are, which are cobordisms. Another interesting fact I want to mention here is that um, among all um, such cobordisms, there is something special, uh, in particular among all knots, uh, unknot plays a very special role uh, for the following reason. So suppose you have a knot such as, uh, say, this trefoil here, and suppose you take um, a copy of unknot very much as, as shown over there, and we want to consider cobordism from here to their connected sum. So unknot is special in the following way, that if you take a connected sum of unknot with any other knot, then it doesn't change uh, the knot. So um, gluing this or reconnecting it in a way uh, like shown here basically gives me back the trefoil knot, which was what we started with. So as a result, we get the following statement that cohomology of the unknot, even from the knot theory perspective, is an algebra that acts um, on cohomology of every other knot, say in this case trefoil. And this, this is a fairly general argument, which again m might be very tricky in several versions of various versions of knot homologies, but this is the basic idea, that's the origin. And another uh, interesting observation is that it happens 
that um, in the realization here, the cohomology of the unknot, which is this algebra, is also algebra of so-called closed BPS states. In this context, they just coincide, whereas um, their origin is rather different. This uh, comes from knot theory and can be computed uh, by, by known techniques in low dimensional topology. This has enumerative origin and was studied by Nagao and Nakajima. In fact, both of these depend on choice of chamber and so on, but they just coincide at the level of answers. And in fact, um, <clears throat> what this will suggest then is that so-called closed BPS algebra acts on the space of uh, open BPS states. This is a more general statement, and uh, in the context of closed BPS states, this goes back to work of Harvey and Moore, who conjecture that closed BPS states uh, form an algebra. In the language of my previous speaker, where if you have something finite, something infinite, you combine them, you get something infinite. Here I could say that if you have closed and closed, you combine them, you still get something which is closed. However, this is no longer true if you have closed and open, when you combine them in a mysterious product operation that physicists call forming bound state, you get something which is still open. So closed times open is actually open. And for this basic reason, we conjecture with uh, Marcus Tosic that um, open BPS states form a module or representation of the algebra of closed BPS states. And of course, uh, this, this um, Okay. Yeah. Well, Tosic, we can really relate to this more because you know, what we've done with Young, we use kind of key structure, yeah, and natural from physics. Right. So uh, this this is uh, trouble for many years to make it really Right. Um, so there are different, completely different versions of. Uh, algebra structure on on the space of BPS states and. Uh, um, in fact, from you and Jan, I've been learning a lot about even different connections, including, say, Mativic, homological, whole algebra. So I don't know which one of them will be a proper mathematical home for, for this picture, but at least, again, at the physical level, that's, that's, that's the story. I would just say that that's the same algebra as Harvey and Moore used. And I agree, that's a good question. For me, uh, again, this was kind of digression about uh, BPS states. Uh, what I was trying to illustrate really is that given a theory, there are many questions you can ask to pass from big full-fledged theory, which probably should be described by categories, high categorical structure, to numerical invariants and vector spaces, just like this q cohomology. So there are many questions you can ask to get from very complicated esoteric field theory down to numerical invariant, if you wish. So, now I'll try to come back to this previous setup and um, really push a little bit further um, this uh, cobordisms between, say, different three manifolds, which, as I mentioned earlier, naturally lead us to the world of four manifolds. So I'm going to take this R cross M3 and replace it by a general four manifold M4, could be cobordism. <clears throat> then, in order to preserve supersymmetry and for other reasons, what's going to happen is that um, on this upper part of the slide, a slide the space-time R, which was unused, will naturally combine with Calabi-Yau geometry into something seven-dimensional. And this seven, something seven-dimensional here is a very boring version of G2 manifold, but more generally, if this is non-trivial four manifold, then it will sit as co-associative, so-called co-associative cycle inside much more interesting G2 manifold, which will be locally the total space of self-dual two forms on M4. So, and this is the cartoon which represents this co-associative four manifold interpolating between M3 and M3 prime. And the ambient space is a G2 holonomy space of dimension seven, which has two boundaries, Calabiao, Calabiao prime, associated to, to the three manifolds here. Now, in a <coughs> physical picture, again, I'll start coming back to, to using this uh, five brain theory and asking, okay, if uh, three manifold before gave me a three dimensional theory, then what about this four dimensional cobordism? And then later on, more, uh, more general four manifolds. What do they correspond to? Well, because total dimension has to be six, uh, the four dimensional cobordism will give rise to something uh, two dimensional because two plus four is six. 
And it has to interpolate, or in this case, be the interface of three-dimensional theories which are labeled by the corresponding boundary components. And that's a general principle that you can just get from dimension counting. So again, uh, this was a long introduction or motivation, if you wish, to very basic principle, which I could have started after the second slide, said, uh, instead of going through this three, three, uh, three dimensional three plus three correspondence, I could have said, okay, let's just do two plus four. So I'm going to play the same game here, but this detour or digression in th three dimensional three plus three correspondence is actually gonna be very useful because we'll consider four manifolds with boundaries and we'll be gluing four manifolds as well. Okay, so given a four manifold, you get some kind of two dimensional theory which is labeled by four manifold and by the same general principle, it will depend on geometry and topology of M4. And this is where the story starts and that's where um, the interesting, um, the interesting uh, dictionary unfolds. The reason is that four manifolds are much more interesting than three manifolds. And for many years I've been studying uh, not homologies in the context of physics, BPS states, and so on, but mathematicians always ask me, why are you doing this? You should be, we are studying knots because this is uh, beginning of four manifolds for us. And I constantly resisted because knots were much easier and four manifolds are much, much more complicated. So this is what I mean by saying that it's very rich math. And if you think about it, then um, this two-dimensional, the class of two-dimensional theories that you get by compactifying 6D theory on, or six-dimensional five brains on four manifolds, it also has very rich physics. Supersymmetry here is very low, so there is very little control. And a lot of kinds of things that can happen in physics happen in this context. So even things like dynamical supersymmetry breaking, which is something that actually occurs in the real world, possibly. Yeah. So if you take this 2D theory and say you, you do some kind of half twist or something, how much of the geometry of the four manifold does it? I'll answer exactly this question in two slides. Excellent question. So now we'll play the same game. We have a complicated functor which takes four manifold and associates to a two-dimensional field theory. Luckily, this two-dimensional field theory is uh, not something general. It's, it's actually very, it's going to flow to conformal theory in the infrared. Now mathematicians know what these words mean. So uh, in particular, in two dimensions, field theories are not that mysterious. Conformal theories, for instance, are vertex operator algebras. So there is probably a mathematical framework for what I'm going to tell you. Because as dimension of this MN increases, dimension of uh, this theory, dimensionality decreases, so we get to more and more conventional things. Now we're in dimension two. Now, there are very, uh, several things you can ask about two-dimensional theory. One uh, thing you can ask is uh, its elliptic genus, which actually already appeared in one of the previous talks. In fact, uh, Yuri Schinkel mentioned that. And uh, this amount of supersymmetry is just barely enough to uh, allow for, for existence of elliptic genus. So you can ask, what is such elliptic genus? Or I'll ask a refined question, what is equivariant elliptic genus? Because this theory turns out to have certain global symmetries, uh, similar to what Nikita had in his talk, so one can uh, refine this notion of elliptic genus to keep track of those symmetries as well. So it turns out, well, elliptic genus, very roughly, if you've never seen it before, is kind of Euler characteristic, uh, or refined version of Euler characteristic. It turns out that if you use this dictionary and ask what does it capture about four manifold, it captures all the characteristics of moduli spaces of instantons on a four manifold. So here N is the second churn class. This C is the first churn class of the gauge bundle. You solve uh, self-duality equations in each case for fixed values of second churn class and first churn class. You get some moduli space, you take its sort of characteristic, you arrange everything in the generating function, and claim is that that's exactly the elliptic genus of this theory, which is labeled by four manifold. You sum over C as well? Yes, you do, and that's, that's this uh, equivariant extension, uh, right, on the, on the other side of the correspondence. Now, non-trivial fact or check, if you wish, is that uh, elliptic genus is famous because it has some modular properties for uh, certain obvious reasons, which I'll show on the next slide, and much less obvious is the fact that this generating function of Euler characteristics also supposed to have some modular properties. So this two-dimensional theory could be very boring invariant of a four-manifold. 
But this already shows that it's not, that it knows something about early characteristics of moduli spaces. And um, here, modularity has uh, to do with uh, work of uh, Waffe and Witten, who studied this, this, this function. And um, their path was, in fact, not so different from what I'm considering here. They consider the six-dimensional five brains on two-dimensional torus cross of our four manifold of interest. Then if you assume that M4 is kind of curved small manifold and try to forget about it, what you get is a two-dimensional theory on a torus, which is labeled by M4. If you go the other way, what you get, and compactify on a two torus first, you actually get four-dimensional super angles because you go from six dimensions to four dimensions, reducing on a two torus. And this uh, symmetry of uh, SL to Z symmetry of T2 becomes the famous electric magnetic duality group of young meals on, on four manifold. And it's some topological version of this young meals because M4 is curved. And uh, they conjecture that this object has to have uh, certain modularity properties. So, uh, Unfortunately, well, th this would be fantastic, and uh, even at the level of other characteristics, we would love to have some access to moduli spaces of instantons on general four manifolds. Unfortunately, it's very hard to construct these moduli spaces explicitly. Unfortunately, we have very little access to even their early characteristics. So if I ask a physicist or mathematicians, in which cases do we know this generating function of the characteristics of moduli spaces of instantons on some four manifold, the answer in this big space of uh, four manifolds will be just here and here and maybe a couple of other points. So this point is K3 surface. This is what's sometimes referred as del pezzo 9 or half K3. And then probably a couple of del pezzos above here would be the only examples for which until so far we can write down this generating function. So that's very bad because, as you see, this is big uh, geography and um, botany of four manifolds. And part of my motivation is to explore this territory way beyond these poor points, even at the level of compact manifolds. And what I'll try to do is I'll try to present to you some new results which allow to construct this early characteristics of moduli spaces of instantons and gain some information way above this example. So kind of push it way beyond what was known. Now, you could ask, okay, what about instantons on non-compact four manifolds? Uh, well, there is a famous construction, ADHM construction, at E, Greenfield, Hitchin, and Manin, of instantons on R4. And Nakajima provided what could be viewed as generalization of that construction by looking at instantons on LE space. By the way, I, LE spaces, which will play some role for me later, are bounded by three manifold, which is precisely the lens space of the type that I mentioned as one of my examples. And that's, of course, not an accident. I'm trying to be efficient and use every information that appeared on the slides. Now, Nakajima looked at this generating series, again, of early characteristics of uh, moduli spaces of instantons, summed them up together. So we have considered bundles of different topology and uh, sum up the results altogether. And what he found is that the result is actually a character of a fine cuts moody algebra where the algebra itself is determined by topology, in this case by the dinking diagram of Cartan type A, whereas the level of the representation here whose character we obtain is determined by rank of the group. Uh, if you, if you study UN or SUN instantons, then this will be the level of representation. So the role of the, the geometry of the four manifold determines the uh, Moody algebra, and the rank of the group on the instanton side determines the level of this representation. Okay, so that's, that's uh, essentially the only result, which again was available until recently, about such early characteristics in uh, non-compact context. So you can view uh, what I'm going to um, tell you next as attempt to generalize this. My goal will be to uh, use this big technology to generalize even this statement. For us, in this correspondence, this character is interpreted as elliptic genus of some theory which is associated to a k-manifold and uh, a d-type uh, un or sun. Now, I'll show you the first um, new result. 
which was derived using this correspondence between uh, four manifolds and two dimensional theories. But in retrospect, there is nothing that prevented us from saying, or somebody saying this back 20 years ago. And this is really very simple. So the idea is the following. Suppose you have AK minus one manifold. This is a four manifold uh, whose second homology group has intersection form of type AK minus one. And suppose you want to build uh, AK manifold by attaching to it another uh, piece which contains one two cycle. And again, I'll use proper mathematical language in a second. Uh, so that altogether, you have a k manifold. Now, we already know if, if this is a TQFT, then um, we know that partition function of the big thing, a k, should be roughly speaking sum over boundary conditions. I'll denote them by rho on the uh, gluing along this three manifold of partition function for a k minus one and partition function for this uh, cobordism, I'll call it B, okay? So this is, again, a basic fact about essentially any TQFT, and Waffe Witten tell us that this partition function comes from a TQFT, so if it really behaves as TQFT or even some relaxed version of this, you would expect that this formula should be true. Now, let's combine this with what Nakajima told us 20 years ago. He said that this is a character, chi, of AK minus one. This, he said, is a character of AK. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to determine what is the Z of B, the partition function associated to cobordism. So the statement that is my first new result here is that this partition function Z of B, which is the sum of other characteristics of moduli spaces of instantons, now on Bordism B, is something that's called a branching function of a coset model. So branching function. of a coset theory. It's a certain object which arises precisely as decomposition of characters of one group or algebra G into characters of a smaller algebra. And here is the trick that the Lie type of algebra, a fine Katzmudi algebra in this problem was determined by topology of the four manifold. So as we're trying to make the four manifold bigger and glue uh, some pieces, which are this bordism or cobordisms, <coughs> we're basically ch changing the type of this uh, Lie algebra in uh, Nakajima result. And if you ask a physicist, or um, in fact, I think many mathematicians from, again, vertex algebra uh, perspective know this, how characters decompose, they do decompose like this. So there is a summation over, say, rho prime. This will be rho. Um, and this guy will be labeled by rho prime and rho. And the only uh, unknown ingredient here, that cobordism B, then is precisely the branching function. So that's, um, that's a very well-known fact. And therefore, consistency of such gluing immediately leads you to, to postulate that the generating function of moduli spaces um, of instantons on such cobordism is the branching function, this C rho rho prime, uh, which is this object here. So that's, again, the first uh, new result. And um, it can be now used to uh, start gluing these cobordisms in different ways to get a lot of new things. Just go way beyond ADE type uh, LE spaces, which Nakajima studied to construct um, results for instanton moduli space um, early characteristics on much more general four manifolds, which you can get by, by gluing such pieces together in completely different order. So that's, that's one result. Again, here the slide essentially explains the same thing I just told you. So again, if you know uh, basically partition function for big four manifold for its smaller piece, then you can extract this coefficient which is supposed to be labeled by boundary conditions. In this case, uh, boundaries are length spaces LK1, LK plus one. <clears throat> 
um, which I call rho and rho prime, and you're summing over boundary conditions here, and then again, very, very general argument will immediately tell you that that should be branching function. So it's a very well-defined concrete object. Now, again, I'm playing this sort of game where we start with the four manifold, we construct some theory which is labeled by four manifold and group G, which is either UN or SUN, and then the point is any question that you're going to ask about this theory, two-dimensional theory, will be some sort of manifold, four manifold invariant. Here I ask the question about elliptic genus of this two-dimensional theory, and as I try to explain to you in uh, this few minutes, it captures interesting information about four manifold, namely it captures information about other characteristics of instanton moduli spaces, which is probably not too surprising because elliptic genus, after all, is also a characteristic, morally or conceptually. Well, you can ask a question about Q cohomology. This is exactly a question Kevin asked me. So if you do the half twist and ask about ground states, that's the same as asking about Q cohomology in this theory. Again, there is a supercharge. And if you think about it, uh, what it translates to is a statement about Donaldson invariants. So Donaldson observables and their multiplication ring is precisely the chiral ring in this half-twisted theory, or put differently, uh, it's a, it's a uh, ring of uh, Q exact, uh, sorry, Q closed modular Q exact operators in this theory. So this theory, which is again a very funny invariant of a four manifold, is not so dumb after all. It knows about moduli spaces, well it knows about their early characteristics, it knows about intersection form. Intersection, um, well, you can also associate a very different type of invariance to uh, this two-dimensional theory. Here we had some numerical invariance, we had some spaces and in, uh, their intersection cohomology. One can also ask about uh, space of marginal couplings in this two-dimensional theory. That's a very well-defined physical question. It spits out some geometry as an output, and I have no idea what this geometry means for the four-manifold. So it's some <coughs> manifold parameterized by M4. So, or labeled by M4. So there are lots of kinds of questions you can ask, and um, this allows you to build a dictionary between, again, four manifold and various observables in this, this two-dimensional theory which is labeled by four manifold. Okay, any questions? All right, so <coughs> in the next, uh, uh, in the remainder of the talk, I'll try to say a few words how one can build uh, such two-dimensional theories very concretely. So um, if you want to implement this dictionary, it would be useful to know how to construct this two-dimensional theory. So we can take various invariants of this 2D theory and it will be invariant of a form manifold. We already talked about uh, cobordisms. In fact, I tried to explain that if you're studying uh, functors acting on homological knot invariants, you uh, very quickly around to problem of studying cobordisms between three manifolds or maybe three manifolds with knots. So here I want to do something opposite and consider a uh, four manifold which is stretched along M3. So this is a neck which, whose cross section is a certain three manifold. Then again, the same principle that total dimension should add up to six quickly tells you that, well, and we already know that to a three manifold you associate some three dimensional theory, but when it's kept off, on the left or on the right, you get a two-dimensional manifold because total dimension is six, so if you borrow four dimensions in here, you're left only with two dimensions in the um, external space. And what this describes is it describes two boundary conditions for this three-dimensional theory, which is labeled by TM3, and one boundary condition is labeled by this four manifold with boundary, another boundary condition is labeled by another four manifold with boundary, which are glued together along the neck M3 cross the interval. So the basic idea in this uh, whole program is to uh, chop four manifolds in basic pieces and then start gluing them together so you can glue um, uh, the theory uh, associated to closed four manifold from basic building blocks. In the past work with various collaborators, we successfully implemented the same process for building three-dimensional theories associated to three manifolds by chopping three manifolds in basic pieces and again gluing them together. So in the world of four manifolds, and now I have to be a little bit more and more concrete as we progress, 
The basic pieces uh, and the basic construction is usually based on handle decomposition. This picture is borrowed, this beautiful picture is borrowed from Agbulut's book. Uh, you start with a zero handle, which is basically four ball, then glue on top of it one handle, two handles, three handles, and four handles. The last two, in good cases, can be attached in a unique way. Also, to make life simple, most of the time I'll assume that there are no one handles, so we just deal with um, and such handle decomposition, which involves only two handles and therefore only two cycles. So simply connected for many folds. Um, information about uh, such handles is usually uh, encoded by drawing pictures on the boundary of this uh, zero handle, which is a four-dimensional ball. It's a boundary is a three sphere, shown here. And what one usually draws is attaching circles of uh, one handles and two handles. One handle is represented by an uh, embedded circle, which could be knotted, could be unknotted, and labeled by a bullet. But um, attaching a um, circle of a two handle is shown uh, by, by usual type of knot and decorated with a number, integer number, which is early number that describes um, the uh, normal bundle of this, uh, of this attaching a circle or normal um, or, or handle, two handle. So in the end, if you're interested in, say, four manifolds uh, which are simply connected and built out of handles, the picture is that you have a bunch of knots, very much like a knot theory, except that you decorate them with integers which are called uh, Euler numbers, and that encodes the information. This is how you label four manifolds. So next step is to construct theories, two-dimensional theories, uh, which are labeled by this sort of data, or start gluing them together. In this case, intersection form on second cohomology of a four manifold is basically uh, given by linking numbers of these knots if i and j are different, or simply by these earlier numbers uh, if you're talking about self linking. So sometimes, again, this, this was general picture, if your knots are all unknots, then it's much easier to encode the same information by so called plumbing graph. So if you have, say, uh, a Kirby diagram which consists of a bunch of unknots uh, linked together in this uh, chain type uh, manner, then in effectively what you can do, you can encode the same intersection form by drawing this quiver type diagram or a graph called plumbing graph where each node corresponds to a two handle. And again, it only works if uh, the corresponding circle is unknotted, if it's unknot, doesn't, not, uh, doesn't have knottedness itself. And then all you have to do is uh, to draw these bullets, draw lines whenever they're linked, and again, decorate everything with these integers, which are earlier numbers. So this is, for instance, the Kirby diagram and the corresponding plumbing graph of the E8 manifold. Okay? I want to point out that it doesn't always work, even if you work with just unknotted circles, then this is um, a good example of a four manifold which is bounded by four torus. Here, uh, the linking number between each of the two circles is zero, so unfortunately, you run into conflict and you cannot describe it by any kind of plumbing uh, graph like this. So it only works for uh, some type of four manifolds. Now, uh, let's come back and revisit what we discussed before. You can build many four manifolds, very large class, by uh, coborgisms very much like we did before. And now hopefully these pictures mean a li little bit more to you. They just mean attaching a two handle. And you can build again a lot of four manifolds by this process, simply connected four manifolds by attaching two handles uh, using the so-called Norman trick, which isolates each particular handle and makes it uh, disjoint or unlinked from the rest of the stuff. And you start with some kind of um, Again, plumbing graphs say associated to this Kirby diagram, it could be much bigger. And then you continue attaching um, additional handles, in this case, making this uh, plumbing graph into a tree. You can even start doing loops again, uh, modular certain provisors, and so on and so forth. So the point is, if you know what to associate to boundaries and how to do this gluing, and this is a question about this 3-3 uh, three, three correspondence, and that's being studied very well by now, we do. Uh, and also, if you know how to, what to associate to each individual cobordism, you can build lots of four manifolds. So this is a very constructive approach, and um, I already 
try to explain to you that Nakajima's result can be easily extended to cobordisms as well. Basically, each individual cobordism gives you at the level of partition function some branching function of a, a coset model. So here is a big summary of all kinds of uh, facts about four manifolds and what they correspond on two-dimensional theories. Some of this I already explained to you. Uh, for instance, uh, cobordism corresponds to a domain wall between theories labeled by three manifold boundaries. Gluing uh, corresponds to fusion of such domain walls. This partition function, buffer witten partition function, corresponds to elliptic genus. Um, its value on a cobordism is a branching function, and so on and so forth. Well, we talked about the chiral ring and Donaldson polynomials. Now, in the remaining 5-10 minutes, I want to do the following. I want to um, kind of switch gears and consider yet another application, ask about uh, various moves called Kirby moves that don't change boundary, but potentially may change four manifold, and also that don't change two-dimensional theories. So these are uh, items here and uh, here, okay? And they'll lead to something new. <clears throat> so, as I explained before, uh, some class of four manifolds can be labeled by graphs, kind of like this, could be very complicated uh, graph, possibly with uh, loops, uh, which are decorated by integers. These are earlier numbers. And let me play the following game. Uh, this can be viewed as a completely different, separate chapter from anything we did before. So in two slides, we're just going to discover something cool. I'm going to... Um, play the following game. Let, let's just even do a billion case, so I'll, I'll use group U1, and to every such vertex in uh, a graph, we'll associate gauge group U1 with its gauge connection A, and unlike what we usually do, we'll um, try to build churn simons theory, uh, whose coefficient is this early number A. So in this case, everything is a billion, and the dots actually stand for possible fermion completion, which won't be important for me. Now, if you have a link connecting such bullets uh, or vertices uh, labeled by AI and AJ to every edge, we'll associate bilinear churn simons term taking gauge field of one of them and uh, gauge field of the other and forming this AI wedge DAJ combination. So question is, which appeared completely for, for independent reasons in say condensed matter literature or, or physics literature, how do we classify all such churn simons theories? So, um, and, and various people have studied it, but I'm going to ask a question, what are the operations or what are the moves you can do on this class of theories, this quiver churn simons type theories, even in the billion case, uh, which are equivalences, okay? And again, uh, we'll, we'll find something rather interesting. So, Suppose you have a piece of the graph which looks like this. You have one vertex with uh, coefficient, churn simons coefficient A plus minus one. It's this guy and the corresponding gauge field is B. I call it capital B, which is linked to only uh, one, uh, which, which is linked to vertex which uh, has only linking number with the first guy of coefficient plus minus one. And that will get uh, in our dictionary churn simons uh, term ADA, begin with coefficient plus minus one. The fact that they are linked together means that there is a churn simons term uh, bilinear in both. And if you try to classify such churn simons actions, uh, and if this is the configuration you have, then you may notice that A appears only in these two terms. Again, if it's not linked, if this node is not linked to anything else, then uh, the part of the big Lagrangian or action which contains A, connection A, appears only here. So of course, what we should do, we should try to integrate it out. And if we do this, uh, we solve for A. It basically, equations of motion for A say that it's minus or plus uh, B. And if you substitute everything back, so A is minus or plus B, then you substitute it to these terms. You see that you get a bunch of uh, terms of the form B, D, B. Coefficients uh, sum up in a nice way. That's why I chose these combinations with little shifts. So basically what you get is uh, you can remove, effectively remove this vertex, which had churn simons coefficient plus minus one. Now, what I did, I did a very boring game. I, I tried to classify churn simons, quiver churn simons theories for you. But of course, uh, if you now come to uh, four manifold people and ask, uh, after we translate this in this graphical language, what does it mean that this graph is equivalent to this graph? 
Well, this is an example of what's called a three-dimensional 3D Kirby move. So 3D Kirby moves are, are these operations on Kirby diagrams which change, potentially change four manifold, but don't change its boundary, the, the boundary three manifold. And in this case, this is operation of a blow up, which takes a part of the plumbing graph, attaches uh, an additional vertex with only one edge, and coefficient plus minus one. And the rule is that if you do that, this coefficient also has to change by plus minus one. So then you can, um, Continue playing this game. This is almost complete set of uh, three-dimensional Kirby moves. Um, again, you see that you have these operations of blow up and blow down, where you can create a vertex or destroy a vertex with coefficient plus minus one, and then it shifts the other guys. If you have some vertex with Euler number or Chern Simons coefficient zero, you can just destroy it, and then everything else becomes detached. And uh, here is another move. So all these Kirby moves are hard to remember, but I want to give you a general principle. If you look at this dictionary and try to think of these Kirby diagrams or plumbing graphs as quiver diagrams for Chern Simons theories, it's actually very easy to remember what the Kirby moves are. These are some operations which typically involve vertices of uh, num numbered by plus minus one and zero, and Morally, they're just equivalences of these Chern-Simons theories co corresponding to this uh, Gaussian integration or even something simpler. For example, here, um, I give you an example of, of this uh, type of Kirby move where you have something labeled by zero. It's even easier. See, if it's labeled by zero, it means that this gauge field doesn't even get Chern-Simons term. Its own Chern-Simons coefficient is zero. So it's only linked to the other vertex, which I labeled by field B. It corresponds to field B with coefficient, Chern Simons coefficient A. And A appears only in this bilinear coupling, which has to do with the edge. So, therefore, if you try to uh, integrate it out, uh, this A appears as a Lagrange multiplier, and integrating it out basically forces B to be pure gauge because of this term, and that's why everything that involves B disappears. So, that's a very simple, again, field theory proof, if you wish, or explanation of. 3D Kirby color. Does exactly the same argument work in the non-abelian case? A non-abelian case is a little bit more interesting. So uh, unfortunately not. Unfortunately it's, well, no, the, the conceptual part does work in the same way. You basically ask, I classify quiver turn simons theories, and again you recover this 3D Kirby moves. So when I presented this to Mike Friedman during this year, he said that it's actually a very nice uh, way to remember Kirby moves because everybody constantly gets confused. If you work with them, you, all, you know that it's hard to remember which way you're shifting this early numbers up or down, so this gives you a, machinery, how to remember it, basically. It's classifying Chern Simons, the squiver Chern Simons theories. And again, that's one application of this correspondence. Uh, in the remaining two minutes, I want to mention application in a completely different direction, which came as a surprise. So in this part of the dictionary, which involves four manifolds, we ask, what about 4D Kirby moves, which correspond to so-called handle slides. These are moves which are supposed not only to preserve the boundary, but also preserve the four manifold. So this should be some kind of equivalences of two-dimensional theories. And this came as a big surprise, because corresponding symmetries or equivalences of 2D theories were not known at that time. And therefore, this is where mathematics gave some prediction about physics, using this uh, 2D, 4D dictionary. In particular, even in the abelian case, it gives rise to identity. This is certain contourial integral for which, which uh, represents this um, equivariant elliptic genus I mentioned earlier that basically packages uh, instanton early characteristics, um, the early characteristics of instanton moduli spaces. And if you translate it to physics, again, now going backwards, so in the previous um, example, I went from uh, three-dimensional physical theories recovering Kirby moves. Here I'm going backwards. I start with Kirby moves and try to interpret what it means for physics. For physicists, it means that uh, this integral, integration has to do with U1 gauge symmetry, and it contains some theta functions, enumerator, denominator, which correspond to various types of Karl multiplets on two dimensions. Boils down to just the product of theta functions, so there is no integration on this side. It means that this two-dimensional theory has no gauge group, and has only matter multiplets, which contribute to elliptic genus as, as a factor of, of a theta function. Uh, 
So what it does, it says that there is an equivalence between two-dimensional super QED, abelian theory with a bunch of charged multiplets, and some free multiplets. And even this statement was actually not known back at the time. So uh, that's a non-trivial duality between two-dimensional theories. So um, I have to uh, put certain uh, decorations on it. In particular, there is some kind of twisted superpotential which makes it non-anomalous. But this phenomenon is already quite interesting at a physical level because if you look at it carefully, what happens is that this free multiplets, chiral multiplets on this side, are basically mesons which are made of field phi, which carries charge minus one, and field psi i, which carry charge plus one. And general principle, same as confinement, which is what happens even in abelian theory in two dimensions, says that you can only have combinations of total charge zero. And in two dimensions, this is especially a strong condition, which ha happens also even in abelian theory. What's cool is that then you can push it to non-abelian theory. This is kind of analog of question that Ezra asked me a moment ago. And here you get something completely insane by physics standards, because until this point, there was no single fact in the literature about non-abelian two-dimensional theories with this amount of supersymmetry. So, Again, mathematicians may not be excited about it, but in this whole story, as a physicist, I'm most excited about this fact because these theories are of very special interest uh, to physicists. They play a very important role in string theory. And nevertheless, until last year, this, uh, there was no single statement about non-abelian theories of this kind. And this is a completely new non-trivial duality, which um, again, to me, is, is, is the most interesting prediction that comes from these Handel slides, from four manifolds. If I wasn't studying four manifolds, I would not come up with, with this uh, duality. Now, everyone talks about fantasies. Uh, Yuri Ivanovich spoke about fantasy of Penrose. And then uh, we all mentioned words gravity and speculation. So I'll finish with one speculation, which hopefully will help to remember what, what we talked about. I talked about graphs. So four manifolds in this context are labeled by this plumbing graphs. And plumbing graphs also come up in um, study of A model. In particular, these are very uh, nice papers that had influenced me when I was younger. So uh, work of Maxim with Yuri Ivanovich in particular and uh, Nikita's work on which, which mentions trees in a very, very explicit way. So of course, when you have a toric target space X, then studying uh, rational curves and maps into that space boils down to um, combinatorial problem, which is essentially sum over trees and graphs. And if you think, again, in a very speculative way of these trees and graphs being plumbing graphs of four manifolds, such problems basically boil down to summing over four-dimensional topologies, or four manifolds labeled by plumbing graphs. So therefore, one may think whether four-dimensional gravity, which has this bubbling, fluctuating structure and sums over different geometries, is some sort of A model. So that's a wild speculation. And on this, I would like to wish Maxim many more years of inspiration to people like me. Thank you for this nice visual talk. Uh, any questions? Yes, yeah, so, so for Hebel slides, there's something like a pentagonal relation. If you pick several of them, which is kind of similar to the uh, probably relation to the, the logarithm and other appearances. Do you get something like this? If you like compose one Hebel slide over the other, over the third, there is some kind of. Uh, no, no, I, I, I don't. Um, I know that there are some. Um, Unfortunately, we had uh, this um, in, in 3D, 3D correspondence, uh, the, um, there was indeed a very nice dictionary between Pachner moves uh, of triangulations of three manifolds and the corresponding operations in field theory. Um, but even in that case, uh, the story breaks down because unfortunately those triangulations don't capture all flat connections. And again, in the end, it doesn't quite work. So even that story is, is poor. In four dimensions, it gets worse because uh, not all four manifolds are triangulable and PL structures are very different. So that's already a bad sign. Uh, but So I only thought about triangulations of four manifolds in this case. Um, I don't know this operation that you're referring to where you have something like pentagonal uh, handle slide. I mean, I would like to hear more about it. Yeah. 
It's some kind of fine diagram calculus, which was never interpreted mm -hmm. in some field theory because you get some integer weights, and now it says it's 4D manifold support. Yeah, so here I'm suggesting that maybe this Feynman type calculus also gets connected to plumbing graph. Yeah. As interpretation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly composition of this Feynman graphs makes sense because this is basically gluing of a 4 manifold. So, and uh, yeah, I think it's a natural question again for at this level, just a speculation, of course. Yeah. So you have these Kirby moves for these Chern Simons theories. Is is it possible that they could be changes of Lagrangian in BV formalism, or is that too much to hope? Or is it um, you thought of because uh, what you did in the Abelian case looked a lot like a a change of Lagrangian in some ambient BV. Yeah, and may, maybe it is. I want to emphasize that this is, for instance, not the same. Um, like a politician, I'm going to answer a slightly different question. <laughs> uh, so w when I first thought about it, and uh, again, people like Mike Friedman and others say, oh, wow, this is a great way to, to encode this Kirby moves, which we never can remember. Uh, but then I was thinking uh, whether this is really a property of quadratic forms or uh, Lagrangians or, or physical theories. And I think it is actually uh, indeed a, a, the right question to ask because after all, these this are all closely connected and I was doing baby operations uh, which you can definitely write in terms of quadratic forms. But unfortunately, it's not quite because what happens here is that even the basic fact that uh, you can add, in these relations, you can just add a vertex, which is completely isolated, labeled by, say, plus one or minus one. That's a trivial Chern-Simons theory, because it's Hilbert space of U1 Chern-Simons theory at level one is one dimensional, so it doesn't affect anything. But of course, at the level of quadratic forms, it wouldn't be equivalence. I mean, we're changing the rank and in a non-trivial way. So, Again, I'm giving you a slightly different answer to a slightly different question, saying why mathematicians may not have thought about it, because it's not uh, just equivalence of quadratic forms, which would be cool. But, but no, it's equivalence of Chern Simons theories, even a billion ones. Um. On one side of your picture, you were considering uh, uh, gluings of uh, four dimensional manifolds uh, bounded by three dimensional manifolds. On the other side, uh, you're looking at two-dimensional theories, uh, also supposedly glued through three-dimensional theories. I'm doing this computation uh, six minus n equals uh, n. Right. right. Yeah, that's correct. That's that's the. Uh, do you know how to compose, uh, say, uh, two-dimensional theories through three-dimensional theories? Yeah, yeah. So this this two-dimensional theories are kind of like interfaces, and uh, or physicists call them domain walls. And the composition, the process of composition is uh, basically composition of domain walls. So literally, you can imagine three-dimensional space with a bunch of planes sitting next to each other. And then you ask, once you collide them together, or put this like a sandwich, right? Uh, what, what is it? So, and there is a very well-defined process how to study this. So for physicists, this is already a good enough answer. The walls are three-dimensional between two-dimensional objects. Well, the, the dictionary is that the dictionary is perverse. So, if you have three manifold, you get the three-dimensional theory. If you have a four manifold, which say could be cobordism, then you get a wall between uh, two phases of three-dimensional theory. So, they all together have they always have to sum up to six. That's the idea. That's that's if you forget everything else from this talk, that's the only thing you have to remember.